Houston, this is Superintendent Carol Cavanaugh, and I am bringing you an episode of Highlights from the Hill. It's been a very long time since we've been with you. Um, today, I have a new employee in the Hopkinton Public Schools, and she is serving in a brand spanking new role, one developed for FY21. It's Jennifer Sucre, and I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about what her title is, and then we'll talk about what her position entails. Jennifer? Sure, thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Dr. Kavanaugh said, my name is Jen Sucre, and I'm the Director of English Language Acquisition, Equity, and Access for the Hopkinton Public Schools. So it's a pre K to 12 position, um, and I'm really pleased to be here with you today. Thank you so much. So tell us a little bit about what that means, because that's kind of a very big title Eng English Language Acquisition, Equity, and Access. So talk about that. Sure. Um, so there is some overlap, although uh, to a certain extent it's sort of two different roles. So for the English language acquisition piece, um, I am the director or sort of the supervisor of our English learner education program. So uh, currently we have 273 pre-K to grade 12 English learners or L's in the district. Um, and I oversee the instruction that takes place uh, for our students. I oversee the testing. Um, and parent notifications and uh, meetings and so forth. So all of our English learners uh, receive instruction by ESL licensed teachers um, in all five buildings. Uh, and as far as the other title of my piece, Equity and Access, um, again also a pre-K to 12 position um, that involves not just the English learner population but the uh, general population of the schools. And the purpose is to make sure that all of Hopkinton students are getting what they need um, academically and otherwise. Um, and we're making a commitment here in Hopkinton at the building level and at the district level uh, to employ social justice and um, teach our students how to become anti-racist and anti-biased um, and our faculty and staff as well. So um, I'm committed to that work and it's a pleasure to serve in that role as well. Wow. So, uh, you know, just to put that, that position in perspective a little bit, when I got to Hopkinton, and I'm in my fifth year now, when I arrived here, I think we had fewer than 50 English learners in the district. And, you know, now we are approaching the 300 mark. So it's kind of exciting work, and, and obviously the community has undergone a very rapid change in just a little bit of time. Um, so... Tell us a little bit about some of the, the particulars of the work. Like, what is it that you have going on right now to achieve those goals? Sure. Um, on any given day, I'm juggling multiple things, as, as we all are right now in this pandemic. Um, so uh, today, I was working on accommodations for Access for L's testing. So every January to February time frame, um, DESI has us administer uh, the WIDA Access for L's, which is the standardized test that all of our English learners in the district need to take or in across Massachusetts. Um, and they've extended the, the testing window this year due to the pandemic. But um, I'm busy looking at um, our students who are L's with, so English learners and students with disabilities, and making sure that the accommodations are inputted properly so that the students have what they need when they go to test uh, this winter or early spring. Um, but um, I attended an IEP meeting this morning as well for, for a preschool student. I am often interacting with the uh, principals and teachers right now trying to arrange for interpretation for parent-teacher conferences. I am busy working on translating middle school report cards right now, which go home in just a few days. Um, so it, it really depends on the day, um, but, but those are the types of things that I've been working on this morning. Yes, and I think that you know, some of the things that people don't quite understand, So. Maybe from an at-home perspective, people are thinking that we, you know, offer English learner education for our students, which of course we do. But I think a lot of what you just described are sort of those behind-the-scenes elements of your work. So we have some students who have special needs, but they're also English learners, so you're at IEP meetings. Or when we send home report cards, they need to be translated into a student's uh, home language. Um, just out of curiosity, how many home languages do we have? Uh, we have, um, among our English learner population, we have 36 uh, home, different home languages at the moment, not all of which we need to uh, supply translation for or interpretation for. Um, and then among the, the general population, pre-K to 12 in Hopkinton schools, we have over 50 home languages represented. So very linguistically diverse community, and um, it just seems to be getting increasingly linguistically diverse. 
Sure. So you've been doing this work for a very long time. You came to us from the Northboro Southboro Public Schools. Now, what got you started in being, an, I mean, I assume you started as an L teacher and then kind of made your way to a district administration position. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm going to backpedal a little bit and explain how I got involved in this field. Um, I always really enjoyed studying world languages. I had studied multiple languages um, in high school and then in college, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it, but I was very fascinated by languages, um, even my own language of English, um, and loved to travel and loved to meet people from all over. So I was starting to think of how could I incorporate my passions and my interests into my, my career and find something. And um, actually, I had never even heard of ESL, quite frankly. I grew up in a very homogeneously white English-speaking community where there may or may not have been an ESL teacher in my schools. Um, I suppose there probably was. Um, and when I was a freshman in college, uh, the girl who lived right across from me, or her dorm room was right across from me, was from Italy, and she was an international student. And she started to ask me for help sometimes to edit her papers. And I really enjoyed that, and I found myself able to explain to her. Um, and it, at that point, I had studied some Romance languages, although not Italian, but I was able to sort of use my, my knowledge of Spanish to explain why our sentence structure was a little different in English. Um, and I, I just really enjoyed the work, so sort of you know kept that in the back of my mind. Um, and then uh, by my sophomore year in college, I had gotten in, involved in a program called English Conversation Pairs at my university. They were looking to pair um, sort of limited English-speaking graduate students with uh, native English-speaking students just for conversational practice, because these students are were students who had done well in the test of English as a foreign language, had the academic language to succeed at the graduate level in a, in a US you know, English-speaking university, but didn't have a lot of opportunities to just converse. So I signed myself up for that and had lots of pairs from different countries and found it to be fascinating and was editing their papers and learning from them and, and sharing meals and, and culture. And I thought, wow, I, I really love this. Um, so the person at my college who oversaw the ESL program, at least for the graduate students, sort of took me under her wing and directed me towards some graduate programs, which brought me to Boston University, um, where I got my first master's in teaching English to speakers of other languages. And clearly a passion um, that was, uh, oh gosh, almost 20 years ago. Um, and, and I fell in love with the field and remain to, uh, to be in love with it. And um, immediately after graduating with that degree, I taught uh, K to 12 English as a second language. Um, most of my years were at the secondary level, which is sort of where my uh, comfort level is, but I did have some experience at the, at the elementary levels as well. And um, I had been teaching for many years and was just thinking about uh, my, my sort of strengths and my passions, and I'm, I consider myself to be a very organized person. Um, and you know, just saw some kind of improvements that I thought could be made, and I thought, wow, I wonder if I could be in a director role where I was supervising an, e an ESL or ESL program at some point. Um, and I found myself enrolled in a master's program um, in uh, organizational management uh, through Endicott College, and I feel like I learned a lot of really great sort of administrative skills there. Um, I already had that kind of strong ESL background, but that partnership uh, was really great and a couple of years later, I was able to sit in an interim position. Um, the director of English Learner Education for Northboro and Southboro schools had stepped away just for a year. So I was able to fill that position for a year and, and sort of get my feet wet, and I loved it. Um, could not keep that position and, and was um, very thrilled when this opportunity came up in Hopkinton and threw my hat in the ring and um, I haven't looked back. So I've, I've been so excited to be here, and it's exactly what I wanted to do. And, um, while my training wasn't specifically in equity and access, uh, working with and on behalf of the English learner population, there's always been a lot of advocacy um, that, that has gone along with it. it. It's much more than just teaching English language development in U.S. culture, right? Um, so it was sort of a natural fit, I think, and um, there's a little bit more room for me to grow, I think, in that field. Um, but it's, again, something I'm passionate about and want to work for and on behalf of all the students in Hopkinton, not, not just the English learner population. Yes, I think you're you know, probably 
getting to you know kind of an interesting place because when we talked about having this position in Hopkinton, we realized it was going to have to be you know a person who could probably straddle the two worlds. You know, you would have to have that kind of background in teaching English learners, but also someone who has that kind of passion for equity and access. Um, and I, I think you're doing an amazing job on that side as well. You may Thank actually you. be selling yourself short a little bit there because I think sometimes we. We think about ourselves as credentialed when we have degree status, but you've had a 20-year career where you have always been advocating for students who, um, you know, maybe not have been, you know, proficient in English, but also had it, it, perhaps like a host of, of other things going on in their lives. Um, so, talk a little bit about you know, maybe just a, a single student or a couple of students that you can identify from your career that you would say, you know, th their experiences in an ESOL program transcended mm -hmm. just language, but had, you know, maybe mm -hmm. kind of a, a life altering uh, moment in, in that kind of a program. Sure, I think, um, oh gosh, there are so many students who have made an impact on me and I, I like to think I remember every single one of them. Um, I think, um, most recently as a teacher, I was teaching at Algonquin Regional High School. So I was teaching English learners grades nine through 12. And um, you can imagine the challenges that uh, immigrant students face when they arrive at that age, um, not having a command of the language, perhaps not having any English at all. Um, so in addition to learning the culture and, and, and the language, also the pressures of credits. And, and time is not on your side. Um, so. That would give me a bit of a, an adrenaline rush. And um, it, I would say, strengthened a partnership between the student and me, but also among the guidance counselor and the family. And many times the family was not even living here in the United States. Many times we had conversations with families living abroad, or we had an appointed guardian that we were working with. And um, it was just so important to have those conversations and talk about what are the goals here and now in high school and how can we get you to reach those goals and also what are your post-secondary plans. Without the students and, and the families knowing even their options, um, you can imagine the challenges uh, that, that lay ahead. So I really enjoyed those conversations and um, bringing in representatives from different vocational schools and military and um, and higher ed institutions and making sure that the students knew about their options. Um, and it's just wonderful to see, and I'm, I'm old enough now and have been in, in the field long enough that many of my students are adults and their parents themselves, and I can see them and remember some of those goals, and it's just heartwarming to see how many of them have reached those goals. So I don't know that I'm talking about a specific student, but there were so many um, that it was really nice to see them go on the path and, and that I was able to help you know, provide at least some guidance along the way. Because we, I don't want those students to, be, you know, uh, to fall in the cracks. Um, they have to know their options and just that, that for me was so impactful. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the other side of your role, the, the equity and access side of your role. Um, I know that you are working on several levels, really, to, to ensure that. And some of that means that you're working with students and bringing people in to help educate students. Some of that means you're doing some professional learning for um, the teachers in, in the district. And you know, some of that just might even be you know, the kinds of work that you are doing just in the, the admin circle. Um, so if you want to talk about those things, that would be great. Sure, I would be happy to. Um, again, a lot of sort of things being juggled right now. So uh, newly formed this past summer is what we call the DEI team, so the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion team. Um, and Chris Ocampo, uh, assistant principal at the middle school, and Laura Tice, assistant principal at the high school, are spearheading that council. And at the moment, it's just open for high school and middle school faculty and staff. Um, and we're working on making our schools more inclusive. Um, and embracing a diversity and really it's it's sort of a grassroots team um, So we're sort of in the process of defining our goals, but that's been exciting work that I've been able to be a part of um, Personally, I'm a part of a community outreach group right now. I'm working with a couple of teachers to put on a cultural events um, sort of virtual event where different uh, forms of art, both fine uh, and performing arts are going to be showcased uh, from a, a cultural standpoint um, so that's one of the things that's going on. 
Uh, I'm also part of a leadership team. There are 12 of us in the district, um, as, as you are on this too, Dr. Kavanaugh, working with a company called Black Print Education Consulting. So they've been contracted by DESE um, through an MTSS Leadership Academy on culturally responsive practices. And we have been lucky enough uh, to gain this partnership with Black Print for three years. And they're going to be helping us work on our uh, district and, and school goals and we just uh, recently, last week, narrowed down our focus, at least for the remainder of the school year, to bias in curriculum. And how can we remove the bias from our curriculum and make sure that our students are getting those missing perspectives? Um, and uh, I'm just really, really excited about that work. Um, something else that we are working on uh, with students is we have an education consultant by the name of Grant Hightower. He is a METCO director for the Reading Public Schools and an experienced educator um, and he has been working with our eighth graders and our freshmen on sort of identity development and discovering who they are and also talking about race and, and sort of their place in the Hopkinton community and, and also in sort of greater society. Um, so he has He's coming to us for a second time for both the eighth graders and the ninth graders next month. Um, that was received really well um, earlier in the fall when he came and he did his first session on diverse American voices. So they are examining literature, um, especially from occluded authors, and looking at different perspectives that they may not get in their, um, you know, sort of standard humanities classes. So that has been exciting work. Um, he has also provided some training to that DEI team I mentioned before on, on disconscious bias. We had had a little bit of training on implicit and unconscious bias, so it was a benefit to all of us to have him join us for that. Um, additionally, Grant has started his work with our fifth grade social studies teachers at Hopkins. Um, again, looking at the curriculum and making sure that our students are, are being taught um, accurate uh, history. Um, and tying in the, the Civil War era, the Civil Rights era, to our present day issues that we have around race um, and uh, making that uh, a positive learning experience for the students, again, where they're being taught at a developmentally appropriate level, but also being taught accurate history and current day events. Um, Grant will be meeting with the eighth grade teachers on Monday during a BBM meeting to talk about uh, their curriculum as well and how to um, infuse more, uh, excuse me, remove less bias from their curricula. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. Um, trying to think of other things. I, I know we have a lot going on right now. Those are some of the things that I can think of right now. Sure. And I know we've done little things like had, you know, visions come in at the start of the school year thank and you. those sorts of pieces. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. Visions came in and, and taught um, the, the faculty and staff pre-K to 12 about having difficult conversations and, you know, courageous conversations. Um, and actually, Grant Hightower will be working with the 8th grade and ninth grade about the N-word, um, both the faculty, staff, you know, and the students. Um, so thank you for mentioning that. And then in admin council in our leadership meetings, we've been reading So You Want to Talk About Race. Um, so that has been really enriching, too. Um, and then uh, I will be hoping to facilitate or co-facilitate a book study on Zaretta Hammond's culturally responsive teaching in the brain um, that would be open to all faculty and staff, too. I'm hoping to get that off the ground actually next semester. Um, so exciting work, a lot going on. It is, and, and I must say you have, you've really hit the ground running. I mean, for a, a few years we've been doing things that have felt a little bit organic or really at the administrative level, and now I'm very excited to see that we are, you know, kind of uh, exploring and, and um, interrogating our curricula to see where there might be, you know, instances of bias that, that would need removal or a revisionist history or those kinds of pieces. And I'm so glad that our work now is impacting students. You know, I think we have always had that conversation about how does the work trickle from the administrative level down to the teachers and the classrooms and the students. And now we have consultants coming in, some that we are paying for, you know, out of grant money or we have, you know, uh, engaged with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to provide these services. So I think we've been very fortunate and I am so grateful for the work that you're doing. Um, you. I guess I have uh, another question for you. Um, you've you know, always been in different public schools and most recently Northboro, Southboro. But what has surprised you about Hopkinton? What is it about our community that has been, I don't know, a surprise, um, unexpected, expected, exciting? 
Sure. Um, just as a direct comparison to North Borough, South Borough, we're one district here. Um, in North Borough, South Borough, you have three, right? Mm -hmm. So three different budgets, and, and you can imagine the challenges that go along with that. So it was a, a pleasant surprise, I don't know if that's the right word, but um, that we have one budget. It, it just makes things a little bit simpler. Um, as far as demographics, the demographics in this community are a little bit different than some other public school systems that I've worked in. Um, and they are sort of ever changing. And of course, with um, the addition of uh, a recent uh, neighborhood called Legacy Farms that uh, brought in a lot of families of Indian origin that has really enriched our community, um, increased our English learner population, um, and enhanced the district in so many ways. But of course, there, there can be growing pains along with that whenever there's a new population or an increase in population. Um, so that has been, um, you know, a, a pleasure to learn about, but I know that there's more growth to be done around that and um, just want to make sure that everybody feels embraced, that uh, the population that lives in Legacy Farms um, feels welcomed, embraced, and also is acculturating to the existing community, and also that the, ex the residents who were here prior to Legacy Farms are also acculturating and adapting to this new population. And um, yeah, I, I think that's probably the biggest challenge. Mm. Yes, and I know that you've put in for an additional teacher in the FY22 budget. So, I mean, clearly we are anticipating that our English learner uh, population in our public schools, you know, is only going to grow. Yes, it certainly looks like that. Yeah. If you had some kind of a vision for, you know, where you would like for our district to be in five years, you know, what would you, what would you think about that? What, what? Hmm. Someone recently asked me a similar question. So our, um, I often get asked, what is the, the dominant home language or the, um, what is the most widely spoken home language of our um, English learner families in Hopkinton? And the answer is very clearly Telugu. So it would be interesting if at some point um, we could look into having uh, not necessarily an entire bilingual program, but some bilingual classes offered in Telugu or some world language classes offered in Telugu, do, Telugu excuse me, that reflects um, you know, the linguistic population majority really of our L population. So th that would be of interest to me to investigate for sure. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I think one of the things that you know, I think if we turn the clock back 20, 30, 50 years, you know, there was almost a, a stigma around having that second language, and now it is so valued for many of our students can speak not two, but three and four languages, and that's just, you know, who they are and, and how they will evolve. Um, we also have a seal of biliteracy. Yes. So kids are sort of rewarded, really, or noted, I guess, for having multiple languages. And maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so back in the fall of 2017, so just over three years ago, the Look Act um, was uh, passed, was made into a law. Um, and one of the things that came with the Look Act, Look Act the language opportunities for our kids, uh, was this state seal by literacy that you're referring to. Um, and I love it. I think that our state is really leading the pack and looking at our students, our, our bilingual, multilingual students as um, more through an asset-based lens and a deficit-based lens, right? Used to be that they were lacking English or, or lacking something, and now we're looking at them and, and valuing the languages that they bring with them, what they have to add. So students can attain the um, state seal by literacy in a couple of different ways, but what's key is that they prove proficiency in English, so in all the, the four language domains of reading, writing, speaking, and listening, and they also have to prove proficiency in another language. Um, for many of our students, it can be a world language that they study in our schools, right? Mandarin, um, French, Spanish, what have you. Um, and for other students, it's a home language. And DESE, uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, has a series of assessments that we can use for that language that is not English to assess the students. And for those languages for which they don't have assessments, the students have the option of submitting a portfolio that proves proficiency in those areas. Um, and then our students in our schools can prove proficiency by attaining a certain score on the English language arts portion of the MCAS um, or even on the access for L's. So that is how they gain that English component. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about, you know, we will call kids L's and yes. then they become fells. And, and yes. I'm sure that, you know, folks at home don't really know the difference between an L and a fell and, and maybe just how quickly students do progress in our programs because I think our programs are, are, are really good. 
um, you know, they, they have high you know, efficacy rates in helping our kids acquire English. So if you talk a little bit about that. Sure, we do. So here in Hopkinton, we, we offer the SEI or the Sheltered English Immersion Program. So students receive all of their instruction in English um, and they are pulled out by ESL licensed teachers or occasionally pushed in for ESOL, explicit ESOL instruction. Um, so uh, the research shows that it generally takes a student uh, between five and seven years to acquire the academic language to succeed in the general classroom setting without any additional support. Um, and, and we do have a really good track record here in Hopkinton of being able to sort of graduate out or exit our students um, within that time frame and sometimes earlier. As you might imagine, younger students where the linguistic demands are uh, less or um, not as, as complicated as, as older students, they're able to um, acquire the language more quickly that they need. Um, so after a, a student um, is in our program, and as I had mentioned before, they take the access for L's every year, and uh, DESI uses a single criterion, which is a cut score from that test for us to determine if a student is ready to be reclassified or exited from the ESL program. So overall, the student needs a composite score of 4.2 and a 3.9 on literacy. Um, those are the minimum. So we don't necessarily reclassify a student with those scores, but that is when we are able to. Um, so we use other data points too. We sometimes look at MCAS scores. We certainly look at grades. We have conversations with classroom teachers and ESOL teachers, make sure that we're making the right decision. Um, once it is determined that a student will be reclassified and go from having an English learner status to a former English learner or FEL status, um, the student remains on that status um, for four years or until he or she graduates or leaves the state. Mm -hmm. So which, whichever comes first. And through that period of four years, uh, that student is monitored um, in terms of his or her academic progress. So the core academic teachers, the math, English, social studies, and science teachers all monitor that student's progress and we make sure that we make the right decision. Sometimes, um, rarely, but on occasion, a student is brought back into um, English learner status and is reclassified once again. Um, but more times than not, um, we've made the right decision you know, using the data points that we've had and the student is able to successfully um, access the curriculum without support. Yes. Well, Jen, I could talk about this all day and about kids accessing academic language, and, but I think that we are sort of running out of time. Um, I can't tell you how grateful I am to have you here and you know, the community for supporting your position and you for the work that you're doing in it. It has been amazing. Um, so a lot of the equity and access work that you're doing is, is just so good for our community kids, curriculum, administrators, teachers, and, uh, and we are so happy to have you supporting some of our learners who, who need the greatest support. So thank you, Jen, for being here with me on Highlights from the Hill. Um, Jen Sucker, again, is our Director of English Language Acquisition, Equity and Access here in the Hopkinton Public Schools. Jen, thank you, and um, to those of you at home, I hope you'll tune in to another episode of Highlights from the Hill.